You know, today's sermon is trust and obey. And I've been thinking about that for a couple of weeks. What, is the, what does it mean to trust and obey? Anybody know? If you really think about it, what does actually trust and obey really mean? You know, in the Army, when we uh, jumped out of, her, out of an airplane, you know, we had to obey the command of the jump master. And he hang out the aircraft, he would make sure everything is safe, and he'd stand there and give the command, stand in the door. And then he would say, you standing in there, you have your hands on the outside of the aircraft, you're looking straight out, you have no idea where you're going, you have no idea if you're over a drop zone, or you're over the ocean, or wherever you are. And all of a sudden he says, go. And you just step out. And you count to four. And sometimes you sit there and you get in a tight body position and you're falling. You go thousand one, thousand two, thousand three, thousand four, thousand four, thousand four. And you're waiting for that opening shock. And all of a sudden the parachute opens, you get pulled up, and you're there. And you're, then you look around. And we used to have a joke was, you have to get qualified to jump at night. And 90% of everybody, everybody that jumps, jumps at night in the Army. It doesn't matter if it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Why? Because when you jump, you're trusting that your person's going to open. You're trusting that the jump master is putting you where you're supposed to be. And you're trusting everything and you're obeying. And so when you jump out, usually do one of these. Just close your eyes and just, God, it's going to work. <laughs> and what are you doing? You're trusting and you're obeying. You're obeying the command to jump, even though you don't necessarily know where or how or where you are. And so therefore, the trust and obey is you cannot hesitate. And when you jump in a mass tack in the airborne, you've got one and a half seconds between jumpers. And it's one and a half seconds offset because one person jumping out of one door, one and a half seconds later, the other person jumping out of the second door, and you have to have the intervals, otherwise you collide in the bottom of the airplane. And that has happened to me in 1977. We jumped out of the airplane, I collided with the guy in the airplane, broke my hand, my fingers was hanging down, and I was coming down in a parachute. And the only thing I was thinking about it was, what was that jump master thinking he was doing? Why? Because I totally trusted him in his command to jump. And then I came down off that parachute, and our parachute got entangled, and we started flip coming down. Well, I was, I was below him, his parachute opened, he eventually, his opened up and separated from me. Mine was in a twist going down. And I kept, and if you don't know how to jump them, your reserve parachute is right here, and you have to pull it with your right hand. Well, my right hand was broken. And on my left side, I had what's called a 1950 weapons container, which is where your weapon went, and so therefore I couldn't get my left hand around to pull the reserve. Meantime, we're fall falling down, I finally get the parachute open, the parachute, the white parachute, it opened, it opened up just in time. It broke my fall. I hit the ground and I laid there. Not knowing if my legs were broke or whatever. I was just, I was actually just mad. And I laid there and finally the safety officer, the DZSO, comes driving up, looks at me and says, Soldier! And I haven't moved. Says, so you pulled your reserve too late and drove off. And I'm sitting there going, we got an issue here in trust and obey. Because I trusted the system that we would jump out, the jump masters are supposed to coordinate the jump so that we don't collide down the air, under the airplane. And we trusted the equipment that it would work. And then when I hit the ground really hard, the safety officer that's supposed to come by and help me just basically barks at me that I pulled my reserve too late not knowing that I had a broken hand and drives off. What do you think happened to my trust and obey at that moment? It went out the window. It went out the window. 
And I was wondering, what in the world was I doing jumping out of an airplane? And the point here is, is sometimes we with God, we have to trust and obey. And it's a blind trust. It's blindly obeying what God wants us to do. You know, once you're in, like, for example, you're a paratrooper, you have to blindly trust everything. You don't pack your own chute. You don't control the drop zone. You don't control where you're at. You don't even know for sure that the drop zone was set up, the DZSO or the DZ safety officers put up the drop zone correctly. You don't know any of these things. But yet you jump out in total blindness and total trust that your equipment will work, that they put you where you're supposed to be, and that you're going to land properly. But how many of us in Christ do that? Do we step out in total trust in that God has got it under control? <coughs> and a lot of us want to make sure it's right. Wants to check it out first. Could you imagine if you have 120 jumpers coming out of an airplane and you only have one and a half seconds per jumper and you only got a drop zone that is so long and every jumper, when he gets to the door, he says, hey, wait, jump master, I gotta make sure everything is right. What would happen to that operation? You'd miss the drop zone. And there's times when we didn't miss the drop zone. In Solid Shield 77, I was a tow jumper. By the time a pair of tow jumpers, when your parachute doesn't disengage and you still you hang out behind the airplane while it's flying. And when the parachute opened up, finally, I looked down, and all I saw was swamp. And I saw the drop zone in the, in the, on the horizon. I trusted the equipment, I trusted everything. I found me a little road, I landed on it. I sat there, I packed up my parachute, I made me a little bonfire, and I cooked me some good sea rations. <laughs> and I waited. <clears throat> Why? I had full confidence that somebody was going to come what? Come and get me. I, it was, there was never a doubt in my mind that sooner or later, a jeep was going to drive up down this road and pick me up. Why is that? Because I totally trusted the system. And at the same time as Christians, do we totally trust God that He's going to take care of us if we're fully obedient to Him? Now, how do I totally trust God and how do I totally obey Him? That's what the discussion I want to talk about this morning for a few minutes. And then I want to talk about what are we doing as a church? Are we trusting and obeying God? Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are an awesome and mighty God. You are my God. And you are the creator. You created us, oh, Heavenly Father. You sent your son to die on that cross. Lord, I want that faith. I want that blind faith that I trust and obey you in all things, oh, Heavenly Father. You are an awesome and mighty God. I thank you and I praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. If you don't, if you, that's a quick sermon. <laughs> you got it? Let's pray. Let's open up your Bibles with Deuteronomy. Chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. This is where Moses is talking to Israel. And he's almost re giving the whole law back to him. And he's reading the word of God, reading of the scripture that was written. And he starts off with a key thing here. He starts off with a key verse. He says, ask. You see that in verse 32? For ask now. Everybody see that? Ask now of the days that are past, which were before you, since the day God created man upon the earth. Think about that. 
He's right here. He's telling you, ask first about things of the past. Now, one guy, one commentary says, well, Moses is talking about what God did for Israel at that moment. How many of you believe that the Israelites that came out of Egypt, that crossed the Red Sea, that was at Mount Sinai, and that was past Mount Sinai, and was headed towards the Promised Land? How many of you believe that they were present when God created Adam and Eve? How many of you think they were alive when that happened? So why is he asking about remembering something in the past? He's asking, saying, God is saying, ask. Well, look what God has done. He's asking you, and I ask you today, do you appreciate the fact that God created us unique? Be not like the animals. We are not descendants of apes. We're not slime from the bottom of the ocean that turned into human beings. We may act like that. But we did not, we were not created like that. God is saying, ask, look back. Why would he say such a thing? Why is that so important? Why? Because he wants you to understand the things that are happening. Continue reading. Ask from one side, he says, ask from the one side of heaven unto the other whether there has been any such thing as great thing as you ever heard of it, like it. Did ever people hear the word of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and lived? Or has God essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, it's interesting, by signs and by wonders and by war and by the mighty hand as by stretched out arm and that by great terror According to all the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Unto you it is shown that you might know that the Lord, He is God. There is none else besides Him. He's alone. There's no other gods. Out of heaven He made you to bear, hear His voice, and He, and he might instruct you. And upon earth He showed you His great fire. And you heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, therefore he chose their seed after them and brought you out of sight with his mighty power out of Egypt to drive out nations before you, greater and mightier than you are, to bring you in and give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Now therefore this day, and consider it in your heart that the Lord, He is God of heaven above and put the earth beneath. There is no other. You shall keep therefore His statutes and His commandments, which I command you this day, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days upon the earth which the Lord your God gives you Forever and ever. So why did why was Moses reading this to, to, to Israelites? Why would I be reading this to you today? Why is it purpose? Why do you think God gave us His Word? To learn about it. Anybody think about it? To learn about it. To what? Learn. To learn. What else? Why would God give us His Word? Know Him. Thank you. To know Him. <laughs> Why is it important to know God? So you can go to heaven. That's a good one. You can't worship a God you don't know. How many of you ever, how many of you ever went to school? <laughs> and you went to school and you did not know your teacher at all. You did not know what your teacher expected of you, and you did not understand nothing about your teacher, and so therefore you sat there and did very well in her class, or in his class. Would that work? <coughs> Wouldn't it be nice to have a teacher that explains the standards to pass the course? How many of you would like that when you go to school? To know what you have to do to pass the grade. That is a nice thing to know, wouldn't it? Or how many of you go to work? 
right? And the boss goes, get this task done, but doesn't tell you what standard the task has to be done. Or does it tell you what the reward will be for doing the task? Matter of fact, this week we're talking about it with contractors sometimes coming to us. And I have people come to me and say, well, I'm going to do this, this, and this for you. Well, how much will that? You just kind of pay me whatever you think is right. Why is that so irritating? Because you have no concept of what is right in their eyes. And it makes it life difficult. But see, God is different. God has given us His Word. And He is saying, trust my Word. Obey my Word. And in, in the last part of Deuteronomy chapter 40, what did He say? That it will go well with you. He doesn't do it to be a grouch or an angry God. He does it so that things will go good and well for us and when we walk and we do things. When you're in training to be a paratrooper, you learn to land right. You learn how to do emergency procedures. You're taught over and over and over so that when the things happen, it becomes what? Automatic. You don't think about it. You know, you got a parachute landing fall. You got five points of five points of contact. It says the PLF, parachute landing fall. Make sure you hit all five points of contact. And when you, if you do it right, you're not going to break a leg, you're not going to break your back, you're not going to get hurt. And the training does it. So when you get out there, you do it automatically. It just instantly comes to you, and you just do it. How many of you get in your car, and you reach down, and you pull out a key, and you go, hmm, which key opens my car door? Okay, okay, I think it's this key. Where do I put the key to open my car door? Oh, it's got to be by the handle. Oh, it's got to be. And then you finally, which way do I turn my key? Do you do that? What do you normally do? Normally you reach in there. And for the normal people, they know what car they're driving. <laughs> they pull out the key, they stick it in there, they open the car door. And how many of you are surprised that when you open the car door, it opens the same way every time? <laughs> right? When you get in there and you open your car door, right? You open it up and say, well, today it's going to open up like a sports car. <laughs> Is it? Or do you expect that to happen? Why? Because you're used and you know what the key does and you know what the things do, so you automatically do these things. But then why is it as Christians, when God give, gave, has given us His Word, has given us His statute, has given us His commands, that we are surprised when we disobey Him and we're surprised when we don't do what He tells us why are we so surprised that we're not blessed? You know? It's like showing up at the Red Sea with Moses. And he sticks his staff in the water. And the water opens up. And you sit there and you go, Does God want me to cross this? And Moses says, Come, follow me. It's dry land now. And you go, Well... What is the water pressure on those walls? And how long will that water hold out? How long will it take me to walk across this narrow path? And how long will that water stay dry? Well, let's do a, let's, as a matter of fact, let's get a committee together and let's figure this out. <laughs> would that make sense if you were there with Moses, got free from Israel, from, from the Egyptians, You've had a fire leading you at night. You had a cloud of smoke leading you in the daytime. Right now, you've got a pillar of fire back there holding back the, the Egyptian army. And you're facing the water. Moses hits the water. The water opens up. And Moses says, follow me. How many of us will just follow him across that? Was 
the evidence there that God was giving direction? It was. So what did the Israelites do? What were they doing? They trusted and they obeyed. And what do we do? Does God want me to go to Peru? Does God want me to go to this church? Does God want me to do this, this, or that? Well, let's form a committee. Let's figure out what God wants us to do. When God shows His evidence in Scripture, how many of you think you should be at church on Sunday morning? You can raise your hands. It's not a trick question. <laughs> Sunday morning is a good place to be at church. What about Friday night? What about Sunday night? What about Tuesday? Are those good nights to be at church? It would be if God was here and there was something going on. But it would be kind of silly to come to church on Tuesday night to sit here in the pew and say, okay, I'm waiting. Tom ain't showed up yet. Where's the pastor at? I'm here at church. Is there any evidence that there's going to be a church service on Tuesday night? No. So am I trusting in the Word of God or trusting in what God is doing in my life if I'm doing things because I want it done or am I doing things because God has shown me evidence of what He wants me to do? There's the difference between us trusting and obeying. You know, as we're looking at the uh, at our song books that we have, you know, I think we ought to go, you guys ever heard the song, Trust and Obey? Let's open up the hymn books and let's sing that song. What page is it in? I don't know. It's not in that book. What good would it have done for me to have you sit here and go through that book to find trust and obey when I know it's not even in there? Would that make sense? No. See, God does the same thing. He's not going to tell you to do something that makes no sense. God, yes, what? Is it wrong? Would it have been wrong for us to maybe open up the hymn book and look at that song where it says trust and obey? There's nothing wrong with it. But would it have been productive for us to do that when it's not even in the book? No. You see, we got to trust God and we got to obey it, but we've got to understand what is where. It's in His book. How can I understand God if I, first of all, if I don't believe that this is the Word of God? How much can I rely on the Word of God if I sit there and I say, well, Pastor, I will believe the Word of God well, when only it says what I want it to say. Am I trusting and obeying God? <clears throat> I'm doing it my own way, but that's not trusting God. If I trust God, that means I'm going to trust His Word. You know, the early churches, you know, we're so lucky. We are a generation that is so lucky because every one of us here has or can have or will have at the end of the service, if you do not have one, the copy of God's Word. How many of you got more than one copy in your home? You know, the early church, they didn't have copies. Do you know how they learned about God's Word? Somebody would read it. <coughs> And then they would hear the Word of God. 
But see, we've got such an opportunity here that we can study God's Word. We've got men's Bible studies. We've got women's Bible studies. We've got Sunday school. We've got groups. We've got things that we can do. Man, there's so many opportunities to learn what God has for us and learn His statutes. And it says, and if you keep my commandments. You know, in the Army, I learned real quick. You have to keep the laws and you have to keep the order that is established. And what's good about it is I knew the difference between a lawful order and an unlawful order. Anybody know what the difference is? A lawful order is something that is a, that's written and is legal by army regulations. An unlawful order is, a, is something that a commander is telling you to do that is not legal by army regulations. So when somebody come to me and he gave me an unlawful order, didn't matter what rank or how many stars he had on his collar, I could smile and say, sorry, that is not under regulation. Because I know what's legal. And I know what is not legal. But why would I know that? Because I studied the rules and the regulations in the army. So now it comes to a pastor telling you what's lawful and what's unlawful. And what I mean by what's lawful, when you bring the word of God, what's unlawful, where it benefits me or benefits individuals, it becomes unlawful because it does not bring glory to an almighty God. But how do you know what's legal or what's not legal? What's lawful or not lawful if you're not in the Word of God? How can you obey and know what is being preached from the pulpit is lawful by the Word of God if you never read the Word of God? <coughs> How many Charles Starlinson pastors are there out there that have ripped off people? Plenty. And you know why? Because they don't know the Word of God. Jim Jones. Had you killed your children? Told parents to give Kool-Aid with poison in it to their babies. You better know who Jim Jones was, right? Yeah. In Guyana? Yeah. What is that in the Bible? What about David Koresh? When he tells a mother to bring a 13-year-old daughter because she's going to become my wife. And the father, when they interview him, he says, why didn't you stop it? He says, man, he was, he, he was, he was the leader, and I, and I don't want to go to hell. So you gave up your daughter? Why? Because you see, people take advantage of Christians because they don't study and read the Word of God. How can I trust and obey a God that sent his son to die for me if I don't even care to know what he's thinking or who he is? How important is Bible study? To be honest with you, Bible study is more important than the preaching. Anybody know why? Because we have to go into the Word. Because studying the Bible. Because you're studying the Bible. But what's the difference between a sermon and a Bible study? Discussion. There's a two-way communication. There's two ways. You can ask questions. You can sit there and you go, wait a minute. What does it mean here? What does it mean in this aspect? And you can study it. And you can get better revelations of what God has for you than you can by just sitting there listening. Because we've got to continue doing what God wants us to do, and we need to keep Him in the center of our heart. We need to trust God in everything that we do in the church. We're getting ready to go and plan next year. And we get this calendar together of everything that we're planning on doing for next year. 
how are we going to accomplish things that we're planning in October of next year? How many of us know what the weather's going to be like back in October? Next year. How many of us know what the weather's going to be like tomorrow here in Indiana? <laughs> but see, there's a point where we just got to trust God. Have you ever talked, have you ever noticed when somebody asks me, I'll, I'll see you Sunday morning or I'll see you there? What is my response? God willing. God willing, I'll be there. Why? Do I have control of tomorrow? I have no control of tomorrow. I, everything that I do, I have to do it in what? In faith and trusting God. How many of you guarantee your job tomorrow? Guarantee. I used to say that in the army. Even in the army now, you're not guaranteed you stay in the army. How many of you guarantee that you're going to be able to get up and go to work? But how many of you are really doubting that you're going to be able to get up tomorrow morning? I know everybody in here is expecting to wake up tomorrow morning. You're expecting to go do your thing because if you didn't, you would not have any plans for next week. How many of you got plans to do anything next week? How many of you got plans for vacation sometime next year? Why? Because you're pretty much confident that the sun is going to come up. You're pretty much confident that things are going to happen. And you're pretty sure that the plants are going to produce oxygen that we can breathe, right? We, wait, we, we go to bed at night and Lord, tomorrow morning, please, Lord, let the sun rise and Lord, let the trees and the, and, the, and the plants, Lord, let them produce enough oxygen for me to breathe, Lord. And Lord, when I get up in the morning, Lord, let there be earth still in existence, Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, produce the things that I need. Oh, Lord, give me air and oxygen. Let me do that every night. Because I, I really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. If you do that, we need to talk. Why? Because we trust. We trust that God created a world that is so organized that the air we breathe is going to be there tomorrow morning. Now things happen to change. But the point here is, do we trust God 100%? Or do we trust our abilities before God? You know, a farmer, a farmer has to trust God. He has to. Why? Does he know, does he know when the things, the things are going to happen? Those farmers down in South Carolina have got the fields flooded. They planned for that, right? You know, one good thing, a friend of mine down in Charleston, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, you know, he told me, he says, Jim, you need to find a church down here in Charleston. It's beautiful. The weather's beautiful. This was back in the wintertime here when I had told him that it had dropped down 17 degrees. And he sent me a picture of him sitting on the beach with a t-shirt. <laughs> Okay. And he says, you need to trust God that God's calling you to South Carolina. Well, his neighborhood's underwater. I sent him a picture of me standing in my yard. Rock. <laughs> I'm saying, God's telling you that you need to come to Indiana. <laughs> things that we really can't play with. <laughs> you know, on November November 1st, I had two baptisms in the church. And they're going to trust God that what they're doing is for God. We had a baptism here not too long ago. They won't give a certificate for it. But how many of you have been baptized? 
And when you're baptized, you pray that the pastor will not hold you in the water, right? <laughs> why not? But why wouldn't you want to do that? If you got baptized and you're in Christ and you got held in the water, this, this is where you wake up. Heaven. Wake up in heaven. Pastor, wake up in jail. <laughs> but you do it through trust and through obeying God's word. And it's all I want to talk about today is, you know, for the next year coming up, this church is going to have to step out in trust and in faith that we do things according to his will. So I want to pray, and I want to pray that we will trust God and that we will understand that we need to get into His Word. That we need to understand that it's not, it's not a book of rules to keep us from having fun. It's a book to keep us safe, to keep us protected. And I probably told you the story with, with Judy, my youngest son, when I was mowing grass. And he wanted to help. He was about to get it. And it was a push mower. And that muffler was red hot. And he said, Daddy, what's that? It says, the muffler. Can I touch it? No. And he looked at me like, with a look like, you know, why don't you want to let me do what I want to do? He started reaching his little hand. I smacked his hand. I said, no, you're going to get hurt. Don't do it. And he grumbled. About the fourth time, touch it, boy. <laughs> he went in there, see. He goes crying to mom. <laughs> then mom comes yelling at me. <laughs> but guarantee you, guess what he never did before? Why would I why would I keep him from touching that muffler? For protecting him. Not that I didn't want him to experience the thrill of the first thing. God doesn't want us to be a part of either. And that's why he gives us his word. And he wants us to be part of his kingdom. He doesn't protect us. We may not like it. We may not agree with it sometimes. But it's doing it for our own good. And you do anything, trust that His Word is true. And His Word will protect us. You want God's blessing? Trust in Him. And He will not fail. He will guard you and protect you. And you will be blessed. I can tell you so many testimonies in my life that God has blessed us over and over and over. I have gotten to a point where we've lost just about everything in the ministry. And God has turned around and has given us about everything back. He has blessed us so much <coughs> that sometimes I just wonder what is wrong with me. Because I've seen so many of his blessings. Why, why don't I just why am I not more blindly obeying him? I would obey a jump master getting out of an airplane seems like faster than I'll obey God when he tells me to go do something. We're going to do a lot of things in this church. And listen, these are opportunities to serve. That's all it is. Because if you want to grow in your walk, then you need to serve God. And a church that gives you no opportunities to serve is a church that is not doing anything for you. You want your faith to grow? You need to step out. You know, when I got hurt on that jump, you know that you know my squad leader first thing he did to me? Because jump, jumping is a voluntary thing. I got up, when I got back to the assembly area, and everybody says, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. I've just terminated my jump stats. This is voluntary. And uh, my squad leader heard me, says, uh, come here, man. Talk to you. What's the problem? I said, this went wrong, this went wrong, this went wrong. 
I'm not going to trust these jump masters. I'm not going to trust this stuff when this happened, this happened, this happened. And what he did the very next day, put me back in an airplane with a parachute on my back. And of course, NCOs in the Army speak very nicely. They never cuss, they never yell. <laughs> And he said he put his boots someplace the sun don't shine I didn't get out of that airplane. The real nice words. And I jumped. Why, but why was he doing that? So I'll get my confidence back immediately. And if you've fallen and tripped and, and spit something in Christ, get back into it. Don't be afraid. God will bless you. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, and I trust you, Lord. Lord, I want to obey your words, Lord. I ask that you would reveal your words to my church. Let me see, Lord, what you have for me. And Lord, I pray right now for everyone hearing my voice. Lord, that we would have the eyes of Jesus. Lord, that we would see people as you see people. Lord, that we would have our ears anointed by you, that we would hear clearly what you have for us. And Lord, and more our tongues, that we will speak boldly the truth of Jesus Christ. That we will not be afraid. And Lord, anoint our eyes that we may read and study and see what you have in your word. Oh, Heavenly Father, anoint us. For you are a mighty and awesome God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Before we speak, no, I want to say a couple.